Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, if you would. I want to preach on God's forgiveness this morning. I got a call from Brother Archer about 20 after 6 this morning, and that's great. God don't make any mistakes, you know what? I miss him. We need to pray for him. But I'll tell you what. He said, you got a message, Brother Joe? I said, yes, sir. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Brother Donnell met... Uh, brought this word out several times in Sunday school. The, the next word, we don't think much about that word. But it says, the forgiveness of sins. Not a forgiveness of sins, but the. That's a specific forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. Looking over in chapter 2, it, it, it says... And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our lifestyle in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, that changes everything, doesn't it? That phrase, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God's forgiveness. Do you have God's forgiveness today? I've been talking to someone that seems like they continue to bring up old sins that they committed when they were young. And yet they say that they've trusted Christ. We're going to look at some scripture. Look on over at Colossians chapter 1. Chapter 1 in Colossians, verse 14. In whom, and whom goes right back to those prior words in verse 13. His dear son, he concludes verse 13 with his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even, there's that word again, the, not a, but the forgiveness of sins. We all need that. We're going to look at some verses about the forgiveness, God's forgiveness of sins. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll try to give you time to turn there. It's important that you realize this is what God says. This is not what Brother Joe says, not what Brother Archer says. It's what the Word of God says. 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, rather, chapter 6 and verse 9. It's supposed to be 1 Corinthians. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. I'll get there. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. You see, that's one of the tools of Satan is deception. It's his main tool, deception. Deception. Be not deceived, he says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or effeminate, and that's homosexual sexuality, if you look it up and study it, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. Now, the Word of God says, these people shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They're not going to heaven. They don't have the forgiveness of sins. But look at the next verse. Don't stop there. And such were, past tense verbs, some of you. Such were some of you. But ye are washed. I like that word. Where I came from, we said washed. 
when I went to Alabama, they said, that's not the way you say it, Brother Joe, it's washed. I said, thank you for helping me with my English in Alabama. Ye are, present tense verb, washed. Ye are sanctified, set apart. Sanctified. And ye are justified, declared righteous. We won't be made righteous till Jesus comes at the rapture, but we're declared righteous on the basis uh, in Romans 4 of God imputing the righteousness of Christ, counting, reckoning, all three of those words mean the same thing. Put to our account the righteousness of Christ because we trusted in him for salvation. Pastor Rowan, he's still my hero and always will be. He quoted this verse almost every service he preached. In whom Christ ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. After that ye believed. You see, the Holy Spirit must convict you and work in you and enlighten you and illuminate your mind to understand the sufficiency of Christ. If you're here this morning, you don't know that you know that you know you're going to heaven or you're listening uh, by YouTube. Listen, you can know as much as you know your name, you're going to heaven. Yeah, it's not a hope so, maybe so, think so salvation. It's a no so salvation. If you don't have that, listen to the word of God. These people that he said are not going to enter into the kingdom of God, he says, now ye are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. The Bible says, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That word justified, declared righteous. Look at Hebrews 1.3. Hebrews 1.3. He just talked about the Son in verses 1 and 2. He said that you, you've heard the word through the prophets, but now you're going to hear it through the Son. We ought to take note when he's talking, when he's preaching, when he's testifying. Who? That's who he's talking about, Christ in verse 3. Being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he... Christ had by himself purged our sins. What's that word means? We saw the word washed, taken away, purged our sins. It says he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Look over in chapter 10, Hebrews 10. Turn over a few pages. A familiar verse, verse 14, for by one offering, he, Christ, hath perfected, you can't get any better than this, perfected forever. You don't have to go to college to understand that word. He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified or set apart. Come on down to verse 17, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. How could God in heaven that created the universe ever forget anything? That word don't remember doesn't mean that he forgot. It means he doesn't hold that against you anymore. The record's been cleared. Thank God the record's been cleared. He says, I will remember them no more. Verse 18, now where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. We don't need another offering. His offering was enough. His offering was perfect. God was satisfied with this offering. Yes. He'll never be satisfied with my offering or your offering. That's it. But he's satisfied with his offering. Look back, if you would, in Revelation 1, verse 5. Revelation 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. We could preach all evening or uh, morning and evening about these three descriptions of Christ. Unto him that loved us and washed us, washed us from our sins 
in his own blood. ED means it's past tense, it's already happened. Look, if you would, in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians, I know we're looking at several verses, but we need this. Colossians chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 11, in whom also you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. This is a spiritual circumcision. Pastor Archer just preached on this here a while back, not long ago. The difference between physical circumcision and spiritual circumcision. Without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism when also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. The cross was the operation of God. God operated on Jesus to fix us. We're the ones that need fixing. He didn't. Notice the next uh, verse, 14, blotting out, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, removed it, removed our sins, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Don't you believe that? You're going to have to to go to heaven. You're going to have to to go to heaven. Look over in having forgiven you all your trespasses, it says. My, 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 in verse 13. Look over in Psalm 103. My dad's favorite chapter. I read it to him every day for 10 months before he died. Psalm 103, verse 3. Who forgiveth what? All thine iniquities. How much plainer could it be? God said, who forgiveth all our iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Look at verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, they never meet. So far hath he, God, removed our transgressions from us. They're gone. They've been removed. Look at uh, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, 25. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I. Who's I? That's God talking. God says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. How much plainer could it get? You say, I don't believe God's got an ink blotter in heaven. He don't need one. He's God. If he did need one, he, he can sure come up with one pretty quick. The Bible says that God's blotted our sins out. They're gone. They're removed. Look over in chapter 44 and verse 22. I, God, have blotted out as the thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins return unto me for I have redeemed thee. My, my, all these verses, our sins are gone. They've been removed. Look over at Micah, a little book that we don't use a lot, but it's, it's, it's got some great truth in it. It's right before Nahum and it's right after Jonah. That helped you, didn't it? <laughs> we'll find out who knows the books of the Bible. Uh, Joan, or, or Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee? There aren't any like him. He's Jehovah God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was all present in the creation. Let us make man in our own image. Let us go down to the Tower of Babel. Let us, all three, members of the Godhead. He said, who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquities and passeth by the transgressors of the remnant of his heritage? If you study the Old Testament, Israel was away from God so much of the time. 
It says he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Mercy is God holding back judgment that we deserve to receive. We all deserve judgment, but God in his mercy has saved us. Look at verse 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou shalt cast all their sins. Thou shalt cast. Not maybe might. Thou shalt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. I like that. Listen, folk, God's forgiveness. Why won't you accept his forgiveness? It's available to you. He wants you to. He says, come. He invites you to. Subdue all our iniquities. Cast all our sins in the depths of the sea. If you look up in Webster's, forgiveness means to pardon, to pronounce not guilty, to remit. He talks about the remission of sins. Our sins have been taken away. Remove a debt that is old. Often I hear people say things like this. Well, I finally forgave God for the tragedy that he put on me. Let me tell you something. God don't need forgiving. God don't have any sin. Jesus don't have any sin. He was tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin. Read Matthew 4 and other places in the Bible about his temptation. He didn't sin. Let me tell you something. A lot of time God gets blamed for things that he's not guilty of. I know he's in control. You You better read the first two chapters of Job again. Satan and God had a had a meeting. Satan said, I'm going to do this and do that and to your servant Job and prove to you that the only reason he's serving you is for what he can get from you. And we're living in a society today they don't, that love is giving for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ loved the church that he gave himself for it. True love is giving, giving, giving. We, we want to see what we're going to get out of the situation. What am I going to get out of this relationship? That's not true love. Right. Satan said, your servant Job, he's just serving you for what he can get out of it. God said, I'm going to show you and prove to you that he's not. You can do whatever you want to, to him, but you're not going to take his life. I'm going to put a hedge around him where you can't take his life. I'm going to protect his life. You know he took all of his animals, he took all of his money, he took all of his ten children. Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Listen, it takes a a child of God that's close to God to praise him and blessed be the name of the Lord when everything's going wrong. But we can in Christ. And see, that's why the, the world don't want our God. They don't want our Jesus because... Uh, We only shout in joy when things are going good. So do they. They're looking for something that's better than what they've already got. They're not getting the true picture. Job's wife, she began to blame God and she said, just curse God and die. And and in chapter 2, the devil tried to destroy his health. Listen, it's hard to rejoice in the Lord and praise the Lord when you're sick, when you don't feel good, when you got a disease. Some of the greatest Christians I've ever met was on their deathbed when they was in suffering and full of pain, and they were saying, Brother Joe, I'm soon going to go to be with him. And I can't wait. I'm rejoicing. I'm praising the Lord. How could that be when you're getting ready to die? Because you know you're going to heaven. Listen, God may have protected you from some terrible, terrible things. That's the kind of God he is. 
He's a loving God. He's a God of love. He's a God of light. He's a spirit. He's a consuming fire. His judge, justice demands judgment for sin. Read and study about the cross. I don't deserve God's love, neither do you. But he loves us in spite of us. He loves us. He gave his son to die for us. God didn't need to be forgiven. People say, well, I've finally forgiven God now for what happened. Let me tell you something. We're the problem, not him. We're the problem. Other people say, well, I, I can't forgive myself, Brother Joe. I'm trying to forgive myself. You can't forgive yourself. You don't need to play God. God never says in the Bible to forgive ourselves. We can't forgive ourselves. But he has already forgiven us. Why won't you accept it? Why won't you take God at his word? I pray several times a day for some people that's on my prayer list that don't have peace and know they're going to heaven. I pray that God will illuminate their mind to understand that Christ is sufficient. He's enough. God was satisfied with him and his sacrifice. He says so in Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. It, it, it's good enough for God, holy God. Why isn't it good enough for you? September the 16th, this past Friday, I was 57 years old. Amen. I got saved 57 years ago this past Friday. Most of the day, I tried to think about how God re revealed to me the sufficiency of Christ, because that's what I didn't understand. Oh, I'd ask Jesus in my heart as a boy growing up every night before I went to bed. Didn't save me because that's not how you get saved. I'd gone to the altar several times and made decisions, but I didn't. I thought I had to get some things in order. I didn't understand grace that God had provided the sacrifice. You'll never get things in order. You don't need to get things in order. That comes after salvation. You don't have the power to get things in order. One of the things that showed me I was lost was I never could have victory over sin. I said, well, I'm going to quit this sin. I'm going to quit that sin. I'm going to quit cussing. I'm going to quit this. You know how long it lasts? It wouldn't even last a day. You have no power, no supernatural power, the power of God. Listen, if there's anything lacking today, it's the power of God. It's available. He hadn't changed. But we have. Listen, Lindy, you ever tried to get up in front of people? Maybe preachers, I don't know. I, I have a little problem with preachers that don't get nervous. I prayed, God called me to preach 56 years ago and I've been preaching ever since and I still get nervous. My, my, that's why I have to have this. My mouth gets dry. I said, God, don't let me ever take preachings as old hat. I don't want to ever get up and preach and not be nervous because I have to stand before God one day and give an account. It's not bad to be nervous. You don't depend on yourself as much as you do on him. That's what we need. We need the power of God. Well, I just can't forgive myself. You don't have to. You need to accept God's forgiveness. I've read all these verses. Accept it. Believe it. Already been forgiven at the cross. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. These are familiar verses. Just because they're familiar don't mean everybody's got them. For 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 18 says, All things are of God who hath reconciled us 
to himself by Jesus Christ. He tells us who us is in the next verse. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit or to happen that God was in Christ. That's the incarnation. God was in Christ. Reconciling who? The world. Are you in the world? That, that includes you. Put your name in there. Reconciling the world, everybody, unto himself. And look at the next phrase, not imputing their trespasses unto them. What's that mean? That means you've already been forgiven. You say, well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. You can't go to heaven unless you believe you're already forgiven. You've got to believe it. That's where justification comes in, declared righteous. When you believe it, as long as you don't believe it, he died for you. He paid for your sins. It won't do you any good unless you believe it. Look at verse 21. For he, God, hath made him Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Look on over at Colossians again, chapter 1, verse 20. And having made peace, I-N-G, continued action. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. He tells us when this happened. By him, the blood of his cross. To reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in the heaven, in earth, or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now, oh, that's a good word. Now, when at the cross, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through the, or death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Wow. Reconciled through the blood of his cross, forgiven you all trespasses. Chapter 2 says, blotting out. Let me ask you a question. If you've accepted his forgiveness, why do you keep bringing it up again? He don't. You see, in our minds, we keep bringing it up and say, oh, oh, well, I wonder if that includes me. That, that means you haven't believed. That's what that means. You keep bringing it up to yourself and then you keep bringing it up to somebody else and you'll even have the audacity to bring it up to God. When he's told you over and over and over again, your sins are gone. I removed your transgressions. I reconciled you at the cross. Why won't you accept that? It's in the Bible. That's the word of God. You can't go to heaven till you do. Till you believe that, till you accept that, you won't be able to go to heaven. I was going to talk about man's forgiveness, but I don't have time, so we'll save that for another time. But look at uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Man's forgiveness is about us forgiving one another. You know the hardest people to forgive is family members. You need to understand people don't forgive like God does. He's holy and but he wants you to go to heaven. He's not willing that it should perish. If you go to hell, it's going to be your fault. It's not going to be his. He's already paved the way. He's already given you a perfect sacrifice and giving you his word to tell you your sins have been removed. I don't remember them anymore. Why won't you accept that? In Revelation 21.8, it tells us who's going to hell. But the fearful, my, my, we don't think that's too bad. You know why some people won't come to Christ? It's because they're so proud, they don't want anybody to know that they don't have peace. My wife said about 
seven and a half years ago, being a preacher's wife for, for nearly 50 years, she said, I decided I'm not going to go to hell for anybody. She trusted Christ. Just before she died, the night before, she ran everybody out of the room but me, and she said, don't you be worried about me now. I'm 100% sure that I'm going to heaven. I got perfect peace. Do you? Do you? You can have. If you don't, it's your fault. What are you waiting on? Well, I, 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 I don't know. Well, you, 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 listen, if you're not sure tomorrow. God gave me a message again this week. I don't know when I'll preach it. It's up to Brother Archer, but the name of it is I Got Plenty of Time. You don't. You don't have plenty of time. The devil's deceived you to think that. Look at John 8, 24, and we'll close. John 8, 24. Jesus is talking to these Pharisees and these religious people. He said, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, where if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Somebody says, well, unbelief's a condition. It, it, it may be a condition, but it's a condition of sin. Listen, who did he name in Revelation 21.8? He named all these different kind of people that's going to hell, and one of them was unbelieving. Their sins are paid for, but they won't accept it. They won't receive it. What a shame for somebody to go to hell knowing their sins were paid for, but they're going to die in their sins. They're going to have to pay for eternity when they've already been paid for. It don't make any sense at all, does it? God help you. If you don't know for certain that you're going to heaven, why don't you trust him today? Why don't you just believe what God says?